Hi everyone, Elliot Jacobson here, and today's talk is going to be on Baccarat. How many roads must a gambler walk down? So let's get right to it. All right, so what we're going to be talking about today are some of the um, traditions, some of the, the mythological thinking that many Baccarat players have. So once we understand that there is this mythological thinking, what's going to become clear is that casinos go out of their way to support and encourage that mythological thinking because it actually adds to their profitability. So if a casino can sort of say, yes, you are right, follow those patterns, think those things, then people might be willing to wager more because they think they, they have some information. Well, of course, when they really don't. And so hence the... Um, the scoreboards. So the big point here is that what do we see in these scoreboards? What we see are some sort of patterns. We're, we're looking for something that's identifiable by our minds as um, possibly providing information. If we can recognize a trend or a pattern um, in stock markets, it's called technical analysis we see something, we say, well, every time I've seen that kind of thing in the past, this thing has happened, I see this thing now, and so therefore I should make this type of wager. So um, seeing illusory patterns in chaos, this is an innately human ability and desire, and it's one that is exploited by casino design. And in particular, this tendency to see patterns is enhanced when there's a lack of control. So when we are in a situation where we cannot control what's going on and it's a chaotic situation, that's when we tend to see more patterns. So think um, in terms of looking at clouds and seeing faces in clouds or seeing designs and patterns in toast or um, anytime there is chaos, something out of our control, then we have this, this tendency to say, oh, look at that, I see this pattern there of some sort. Now, why, does that, why did that evolve with us? Well, if we think about the sorts of situation our ancestors millions of years ago were involved with, they were in a, essentially a chaotic universe. They, they had no science, no real understanding of anything that was going on, but they did have minds that were trying to make sense of it. So those people who attempted to see patterns and draw conclusions from them were more likely to survive than those who were completely and totally random. So think, hey, there's a tiger. What should I do in the presence of a tiger? Well, if every time I see a tiger, I run, then I'm going to get eaten, right? But if when I see a tiger, I um, take up a weapon to defend myself or I let's say, climb a tree, right? I try something else. I try and understand that there's a pattern to the behavior of, of that interaction. And honestly, I'm not sure what works with a, a lion, maybe a bear, right? We can think about, do you stand still or do you run? What about a rattlesnake? What do you do if the rattlesnake is crossing your foot? So all of these chaotic situations that are coming up, those people who, who didn't try any variations didn't try and understand or make sense of that pattern were, were the ones who died. And so this tendency to try and impose um, meaning onto patterns comes from very ancient evolutionary psychology. And it just persists now in pretty much everything we do in day-to-day -day life is um, that involves any sort of chaotic situation will also involve patterns. And the stock market is the perfect example of this. You see people talking about um, Elliott waves, right? Or Fibonacci or, or um, looking at the amount, the distance between peaks or uh, any sort of other technical analysis you can think of has been done. And technical analysis essentially means looking at past behaviors of this chaotic graph in an attempt to predict the future behavior. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But that is exactly what we're talking about with um, creating patterns from chaos. So in Bakra in particular, all patterns are meaningless. And these patterns are um, made up on the scoreboard by what are called roads. And I'll show you that in just a minute. So unlike the tiger situation or the bear or the snake or the stock market, where understanding patterns might actually lead you to a solution, there is no solution in Baccarat. 
there is no solution in totally random phenomena. And so this sort of bleed over in evolutionary psychology is what's at work here, even though it has zero um, impact on the outcomes. So just to give you an example, so you can see for yourself um, in your own mind what happens with patterns. Here is a Rorschach test. Well, it's not a full Rorschach test. This is half of a test. So what do you see in this? Well, I'm guessing you don't see much of anything. Um, maybe you see, well, I'll tell you what I see. I see my father leaving my mother when uh, I was eight years old and, and moving into a hotel and I go over there and see W.C. Fields movies um, and then he'd take me to the park and feed ducks. I'm sure you see the same thing. You don't? I thought it was obvious. Well, all right, let's just add the reflection to this thing. And now we have an actual Rorschach design. And now I'm thinking you see a pattern here. Maybe I'll tell you what I see and I really see is some sort of face, possibly the face of an animal. Um, and that would be sort of a typical thing that we do. Once there's some symmetry in this pattern, that impacts our mind even more, right? We tend to see patterns in the presence of symmetry. We impose all sorts of other things that we know that are symmetric, like the face of an animal is, is symmetric, right? So um, that's the bleed over that works there. Well, let me give you another one. What do you see here? This is just a picture of some sun behind the clouds. Um, nice picture. Do you see my mother and father? No. Um, well, I think what you're supposed to see is some sort of fire-breathing dragon. Um, but again, that's a completely random thing that our minds impose onto this picture that has almost nothing to do, well, okay, it has nothing to do with the physical phenomena that we're seeing here. And how about this one? This one I think is especially interesting. What do you see here? I'm going to give you three seconds. You don't see anything at all? Neither do I. Uh, this is just a random picture of a tortilla. All right, so if you saw something, put it in the comments. I'm curious to know what you saw here. So this is what's going on. Um, and I first learned about illusory pattern perception with an article written by Michael Shermer that appeared um, in Scientific American, I think it was 2008. And more recently, this I think this um, article that I have up here is from 2011. So if you want, go um, Google this title, Connecting the Dots, Illusory Pattern Perception Predicts Belief in Conspiracies and the Supernatural. And I'm just going to read the abstract to you. A common assumption is that belief in conspiracy theories and supernatural phenomena are grounded in illusory pattern perception. In the present research, we systematically tested this assumption. Study one revealed that such irrational beliefs are related to perceiving patterns in randomly generated coin toss outcomes. So that would be in the gambling region. In study two, pattern search instructions exerted an indirect effect on irrational beliefs through pattern perception. In other words, when, um, well, when we think that, that when we're told there's something, then we'll tend to see it, right? When we are told that something should exist, um, whether it's a deity or a, a picture in a cloud, it's easier to see it. We tend to um, latch on to what people tell us about this chaos. Study three revealed that perceiving patterns in chaotic but not structured paintings predicted irrational beliefs. In study four, we found uh, um, that agreement with texts that support paranormal phenomena or conspiracy theories predicted pattern perception. In study five, we manipulated belief in a specific conspiracy theory. This manipulation influenced the extent to which people perceived patterns in world events, which in turn predicted unrelated irrational beliefs. We conclude that illusory pattern perception is a central cognitive mechanism accounting for conspiracy theories and supernatural beliefs. I think that using these boards, these predictive boards in Baccarat qualifies as a supernatural belief because what you believe is that the cards have memory, that the cards know they're supposed to do something, that the outcomes are not totally random one following each other, that 
that somehow the universe has patterns that we can perceive, even though what's really going on there is total chaos. So if you're interested, this is a paper um, worth tracking down. If you really want to get into Michael Shermer's presentation, The Believing Brain, all right? Grab this book off the Amazon. It'll, um, you'll have a lot of fun with it. It'll really dive deeply into what we're talking about, our tendency to believe things. Okay, so this is a picture then of one of these boards accompanying a Baccarat table. You see it in the upper right there. And you notice that these boards are pretty much at every table at all of the major casinos. So what do these boards look like? Well, they have on them the following things, these things called roads, the big road, the small road, something called the big eye boy, the cockroach pig. So these are all gonna be pattern recognition um, devices. Some of them will also just have raw numbers, the number of players that have occurred in the shoe, bankers and ties. They might tell you how many times the pair bet has won if that bet's included. On some easy Baccarat tables, I've also seen the number of dragons and panda uh, side bets that have hit located um, on that scoreboard as well. And I don't know what else you're gonna find, but typically a lot more. So here is a scoreboard um, that I got off the internet. We see in the upper part of this, that we have the 38 bankers, 30 players, zero ties. You see we have the pair bet, um, and then they're also keeping track of how many naturals there are. And here is the scoreboard, and here we see the different roads, right? So I'm just gonna focus here on uh, the big road, which is this major part going on right here. And this is simply gonna tell us whether banker or player won the particular hand. So red is banker, blue is player. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to um, look at this. And based on your studying this, I want you to tell me what you would bet next. What do you think is the best bet you could make after you look at this? All right, you are, you are now the gambler at the table. I'm going to tell you there is a correct answer here. You look at this, what bet would you make? All right, Jeopardy theme song playing in background. All right, if you said banker, you are correct. Banker is absolutely the bet you should make based on the scoreboard. Well, why is that? Well, it actually has nothing to do with the scoreboard at all. It's simply that banker has a, a smaller house edge, 1.06% compared to um, player that has 1.24% house edge. If you wanna make the best bet, you should just always make a banker bet, all right? Nothing about this board is going to help you do any better than simply making another banker bet. And I have to tell you, I have used that strategy in a casino. I um, claim I personally, I will tell you right now, I am the world's greatest Baccarat player of all time. I play perfect Baccarat. Now by perfect Baccarat, I'm just gonna assume you have to bet every single round, all right? I play perfect Baccarat. I was um, doing a little bit of consulting for a casino that had to do with some money laundering that was going on. So I had to play Baccarat uh, for, I think, four hours at this one casino. So I sat down at the table. I think it was a $25 minimum bet where I had to position myself. And I simply bet $25 on Banker. Next hand, $25 on Banker. Next hand, $25 on Banker. You get the idea? All right, nobody in that casino who was playing Baccarat and betting every hand had a better um, chance of a successful outcome than me, all right? I theoretically lost the least amount of money of everybody in that casino. Now, some players may have won, some may have lost a lot more, right? But I'm betting the table minimum on the wager that has the smallest house edge. But Players around me would just say things like, you could never win playing that way. How come you're playing so stupidly? This belief that somehow you have to change your wager size, that you have to change from player to banker um, to try and follow some patterns you're seeing, all right? That that's absolutely does not exist. You can, of course, change the side you wager on. If you make player bets, you'll be playing with a slightly um, higher house edge. If you wager more, then the house edge will take out theoretically more from that wager um, as your fee for having played that hand. So the world's greatest Baccarat player 
plays table minimum wager on banker every hand. All right, got that? Now, if you're playing um, some commission-free variants, I will tell you that that flips over to player. You should just make a table minimum wager on player every single hand. And I'll show you an example of that a little bit later. All right, so let's see how well you did. This is um, the old hand score card. So what would you um, wager after if this was the scorecard you were keeping? You got it, right? You're going to bet on banker table minimum. That's exactly the right bet to make. That's always the right bet to make. Nothing, no pattern you see in this card has any meaning whatsoever. So um, one more, and let me just talk now when we're looking at this one in particular. So why do casinos have these scoreboards up on every single table? Well, they have them up there because, number one, the old-fashioned method of keeping score where you write out everything by hand is just very, very slow. So these are much faster. They don't have to take the time for you to be um, wait for everybody to record on their own personal sheets. So you don't have the expense of those paper boards. You don't have the time wasted of people writing stuff out. And you can show a lot more patterns on one of these things than you'll see on one of those scorecards. So the upshot is that people are going to be much more likely to see an illusory pattern um, by giving them every possible thing to look at. They're more, and when somebody sees that pattern, then they're more likely to wager. And if they really see a strong pattern, they're more likely to wager even more, right? So you want to give players as much opportunity as possible to see a false pattern. So um, the other thing is, so the games move faster, you don't have the expense of the paper uh, scoreboards and you have the opportunity to see more patterns. So these things um, are tremendous money makers for the casino. Every casino should be using these things on every Bakra table because they get people to, to wager more, to play um, with these patterns. All right. You'll also see the exact same thing on roulette. Again, another game that's totally chaotic, but we might think we see a pattern here. And every time we think we see a pattern, which numbers are hot, which are cool, which numbers are due, which one, ones have been coming up a lot, a lot of odds, a lot of evens, whatever it is, um, reds or blacks, we want to give the player as many opportunities as possible to see a fault, illusory pattern. Every time they see that pattern, that's just going to make them more likely to um, make a wager. And that's what you want. So what you absolutely never see is you never see a scoreboard on a blackjack table. Could you imagine a scoreboard on a blackjack table giving you the high-low count, giving you an ace-side count? telling you the um, current odds of a blackjack happening on the next hand. So those are numbers that could actually impact the house edge. Those are numbers in a game like blackjack that could help a card counter, could help an ace sequencer, right? Could help you in your insurance decisions. So we're, a casino is never going to give useful information. So what you should know is that just by virtue of these boards existing, that they must benefit the house and they must not benefit the player, right? The, the casino is always going to act in its best interests. So by virtue of you are seeing these scoreboards, you have got to know that these help the casino, right? If they didn't help the casino, you'd have them on blackjack tables to, for card counting. All right. So what I want to do now is just give you an example. Let's go play Baccarat for a weekend. And we're going to do exactly what I said. We're going to play one of these commission-free variants where the best wager is player. And we're going to play 50 shoes of Baccarat. We're always going to wager on player. And we're at a table that's a $100 minimum wager. So we're going to make the table minimum of a $100 uh, wager. So what I'm doing here is it's roughly equivalent to every method of play, only it's the world's best way you could play on this particular commission-free um, variant. So I have a spreadsheet. Um, it, it's available on the website advancedadvantageplay.com. I will link to it uh, in this article. So you can track down this, this particular 
um, simulation if you want to give it a try. So let me show this to you now. So what we have here in this spreadsheet is um, a simulation. Now these curves, the red curve, the blue and the yellow, these represent standard deviations. The black line represents zero, break even. And the red line, the central red line, that represents the theoretical edge um, that the house is playing at. So over the long run, that is your theoretical, right? That's your theoretical loss. We're not saying you will or won't necessarily have be at that value, but that is the theoretical that, for example, your comps are based on. And the green line in the center, that's your actual result for these 50 shoes. So when we talk about um, standard deviations, you notice the yellow, that represents the first standard deviation. So 68% of the time, you should be somewhere between the two yellow lines. The next two lines, um, the blues here represent the second standard deviation. The red line is the third standard deviation. And only about, I think, 0.2 or 0.4% of the time will your results ever even get outside the third standard deviation. So let's play a few weekends and just see what our experiences are like. Okay, here is a weekend where we started off very badly. You notice that we're going down and touching two standard deviations below expectation. We stay one standard deviation below expectation for most of the first day, and then suddenly we break through our theoretical and we go on a tremendous winning streak. And look, we're way above average. Average um, is this red line. And then we're, we break even. And then we're above the first standard deviation. And so we peak in our winnings here about two thirds of the way through our trip. Now, what some people will say is, well, you should leave when you're ahead, right? And so um, they might say, well, if you were a smart gambler, you would know to leave at this point. You have hit some sort of win goal. Well, that assumes that the cards have memory, that the cards will, will say to you, they'll say, hey, I remember you. If you play any more, I'm going to make you lose. But if you go home for a week or go home for a month or go home for until your next trip, then I will be nice enough to let you win again, right? So there is this belief that somehow the cards know who you are, that this sort of next part of the curve that leads back down again wouldn't happen if you left and then come back. Well, what is going to happen is every time you go to a casino, you're going to have some random trip. Look at this one. This is a very interesting trip, right? We are having a very bad trip. We're at the first standard deviation below expectation up until about halfway through our trip. Then we go on a nice winning streak and we end um, the trip one standard deviation, nearly one standard deviation above expectation. And we are actually winning. But unfortunately, we played that last shoe that was a tremendously bad shoe and we lost again. So think if you were looking at a board during this trip right here, one of these scoreboards, right? You might feel like, like your ability to read the board was really bad. You don't know how to read these boards, right? Maybe you then spoke to your friend who gave you some advice on how to read the board. You took their advice and all of a sudden you started winning. Wouldn't you then create that pattern perception, that illusory pattern perception that that friend who gave you that advice knew something about the game, that they had some deep understanding about the game that they were trying to convey to you about which patterns to look for in the scoreboard, right? Wouldn't you then, if that person happened to write a book or post on an internet um, forum, want to follow their advice going forward? Because after all, you're having this really crappy trip and they saved you, right? They, they saved your bacon. But this is not what's going on. This is just a random trip. All of these trips that you can take are just going to be another random experience. Look at this. This is a great trip, right? Look, you were two standard deviations. You won more than $5,000. Look at the left hand, right? Here about 80% through your trip, you're up $5,000. Do you know that it's time to leave now, right? Well, maybe that friend whose advice you were taking, you took it through this trip and you thought, oh, this is so great. It's now it's so easy to win at Bakra. And then you got all the way up here, up $6,000 with your friend's advice. But then you started to lose and you lost and you lost. and You ended up the trip um, having lost money. So what happened here? Well, you might think to yourself again, creating illusory patterns that this was your fault 
that somehow maybe you were tired, maybe you committed a sin like having sex during the weekend, and now the cards had to get you because you're not allowed to do that. Maybe you left a door open and the wind blew through, right? Or maybe you didn't uh, smack the cards correctly. Um, you know, the, the gods were against you, right? So they're gonna take your money away. So again, we, we find ways to put patterns onto what we're seeing when it's really just chaotic randomness. So I think that it's an interesting exercise if you believe that these uh, scoreboards have some meaning to use this spreadsheet um, and invent stories for your weekend trip with 50 shoes, right? And see whether you can't visualize yourself having that experience and what would go on in your own head. Now, I'm not blaming you for this. This, again, this is a, a human quality to um, want to see these patterns, right? This is something we do. But recognizing that you do that allows you to get past it and say, now, what is the best bet? The best bet is the smallest amount with the least house edge, right? Unless you're an advantage player, in which case you're going to look for something else or you're playing for coupons or free play or, or lost rebates or, you know, you you're edge sorting and Phil Ivey is there with you at the table, whatever the extra information you have, good for you. Um, but if you're just a, a straight player who thinks you can read these boards, tell yourself the stories, right, and see what's happening. Look at this poor guy. Three, more than three standard deviations. More than three standard deviations. This is the worst trip you ever had, right? You have lost at $100 a hand, look at this, you've lost over $20,000 in about 40 shoes. That's amazing. You've lost $20,000 just betting $100 at a time. So are you destined to win after that? Is this curve somehow trying to get back to this red line? No. You've lost $20,000. There is no obligation for this green curve, your, your curve, to ever come back. So you're probably pretty happy it did. You won about 10,000 back from your low point, but there's absolutely no obligation. There's nothing at all that says that the cards have to do that. So this might um, tend to reinforce your belief in what's called the gambler's fallacy, that the cards have a memory, that winners must lose, that losers must win, that if things have been, um, if you change what you're doing because you think, oh, every time I did this, I lost, now I'll do this, I'll win, that that worked, and now you believe in this other thing, right? You were so desperate to try new things, you tried this new thing and it worked, and now forever you'll believe that. So this is really a good one to tell yourself a story with, right? I have um, other Bakra videos that I'm gonna encourage you to look at. If you tell yourself any other story other than this is totally random. So please play with this spreadsheet and learn its lessons. Okay. So in summary, all Bakra roads are meaningless. Decisions made by seeing illusory patterns, these decisions do not change the house edge. They have nothing to do with the house edge. You are not changing um, your long-term win or loss rate. These um, boards do help the casino because they speed up the game. They encourage larger bets from the players when they think they see clear patterns and then they, they don't have the costs of those paper boards. And what is true is some players get lucky. And just because a player gets lucky doesn't mean they know anything, all right? Just because a player gets lucky and then posts all over the internet about these methods that they use doesn't mean they know anything. And let, let me just go further. They don't know anything. They don't know anything. They will act like they know things. They will um, go be very proud of themselves and the results. They'll want to boast and brag about who they are. They don't know anything, all right? So do not believe in the winners. There have to be winners. That's just the nature of statistics. Just because somebody won does not mean they know anything. And that's um, maybe the most important lesson of all here. 
Okay, that's all for this talk. I hope that you have gotten something from it. Um, I want to invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Advanced Advantage Play. Please visit my website, advancedadvantageplay.com, for more videos and other fun things to look at uh, related to all aspects of casino game play. So thanks a lot, and we will see you later. Thank you.